And now, it's story time. It was around 2 a.m. in a small apartment near the University of Tokyo when Aiko was video chatting with her boyfriend, Riku. Her roommate Hanada burst out of her room with a giant rolling suitcase behind her and a bulging backpack around her shoulder. Aiko shot her a confused glance and asked what all the bags were for. I'm heading to my mom's in Kawasaki for a while. I told you that. What? No, you can't be traveling right now. Haven't you been watching the numbers? COVID cases are the highest they've ever been. You absolutely can't leave. Whoa, you need to calm down. Me and Riku haven't seen each other in weeks and we're 10 minutes away, but you don't see us complaining about it, do you? Hey, Hanada. Riku's voice echoed from Aiko's laptop. This is for our own safety. Hanada looked away for a moment. My mom's, you know, she's not getting any younger. If something were to happen to her and I wasn't there, she trailed off and looked away. Aiko exhaled deeply and apologized. Hinata reassured her that she had plenty of hand sanitizer, disinfectant wipes, and that the trains would probably be pretty empty. I'll be fine, I promise. I'll see you once everything calms down a bit. Hinata hobbled through the living room with her bags. Just as she reached for the door, Aiko added, Oh, and... Beware of Kuchisake Ona. Hinata turned to her. Riku sighed. Really, Aiko? God, you're so immature sometimes. Just let her leave. Wait, Kuchisake Ona? That's like some super old urban legend, right? So you know the story then. Ignore her, Hinata. After what happened to Naomi, Hinata needs to know. Naomi was not killed by Kuchisake Ona. It was a total freak accident. She was. If you're going to be traveling alone right now, you need to know the story of Kuchisake Ona. A long time ago, in the Heian period, lived a samurai and his beautiful wife. She was so beautiful, in fact, that anyone who saw her couldn't help but stare at her enchanting brown eyes, her smooth skin, and flowing ebony hair. She would walk around town and coyly ask those who stared, Am I pretty? while fluttering her lashes flirtatiously. She loved the attention but her husband did not. She would reassure him that it was all completely harmless. Aren't you proud to have such a beautiful and desirable wife? Her husband did his best to subside his jealousy, but one day he discovered that she was a liar and that she was being unfaithful to him, just as he had suspected. So one day, when she was brushing her hair, he snuck up behind her and grabbed her head. He drew a knife and dragged the blade across her mouth from cheek to cheek, leaving her with a horrendous, gaping wound. A permanent red smile. Who will think you're pretty now? He said. She ran out of the house in tears. Everyone stared at her, but this time, in disgust. She pleaded for their help, but no one would come near her. She ran far away from her village until she could run no longer. She laid on the ground by the river, blood flowing from her mouth just as the water next to her. This is where she died, completely alone. After her death, there were rumors that she had returned to the village, but as a vengeful ghost. They called her Kuchisake Ona, the, the slit-mouthed slit woman. Villagers claimed to see her wounded face in the streets at night when they were completely alone. Well, those who were lucky enough to get away in time. Centuries later, people still report seeing Kuchisake Ona. They say that she blends into the crowds wearing a trench coat and a surgical mask to hide her twisted grin. She targets those who are alone. She will approach you and ask you a question. Am, Am I pretty? pretty? If you answer yes, she will remove her mask and reveal her disfigured face and ask you again, am, am I, I pretty, pretty now? And if you don't answer yes again, she oh, will- Oh crap, I'm gonna be late for my train. Hinata interrupted Aiko's story and made her way toward the door. 
Aiko called after her, but Hinata was already gone. The streets were dead quiet. Hinata chuckled to herself at the thought of Kuchisake Ona being real. Just then her phone rang, causing her to skip a step. Hey, you. Ugh, I thought she'd never get off the call, said Riku's voice from the phone. I'll see you in a little bit. Not unless Kuchisake Ona gets you. She finally reached the train station and waited at the platform, which was completely empty, just as she expected. She boarded, took out her disinfectant wipes, and wiped down her seat before sitting down. As the train began to move, she pulled off her mask and placed it in her bag. She pulled out her phone and began playing a mobile game. At the next stop, she noticed, out of the corner of her eye, someone get on the car adjacent to hers. She looked up and saw a woman with long black hair down her back. Her trench coat collar was popped up a bit and her surgical mask hid most of her face. Plenty of people wear trench coats, Hinata thought to herself. She looked back down at her game, but she couldn't stop thinking about the woman in the next car over. She lifted her head again to look at her and saw her pressed up against the window of the car, her dark brown eyes looking right at her. Hinata jumped in her seat. The woman opened the door and came inside. Hi, I'm so sorry. Can I ask you a question? I think I got on the wrong train, but I'm not sure. Are we going north or south? Um, north, Hinata replied, still catching her breath from being startled. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. The woman bowed and sat down across from Hinata. Hinata pulled her phone out again. Her eyes may have been on her game, but her focus was entirely on the woman sitting across from her. I'm so sorry, the woman spoke again, leaning towards Hinata. Can I ask you another question? Um, of course. What's up? Well, the woman stood up. I'm on my way to see my boyfriend. She took a step closer. We haven't seen each other since the lockdown, and gosh, this sounds so silly, but... She took another step closer. Every muscle in Hinata's body was completely tense. How do I look? Like, do I look okay, or...? The woman was a foot away from Hinata, silently waiting for a response. Um, I, I think you look great. Mask and all. Oh, good, good, thanks. I appreciate that, but... Just to be sure, she crouched down until she was face to face with Hinata. Do you think I'm pretty now? The woman peeled the mask off her face to reveal a mouth completely cut open at the sides, revealing all of her rotten teeth. The woman let out a loud and pungent breath in Hinata's face as Hinata's screams echoed inside the empty train car. At the Tabata station, Riku was waiting at the platform. He checked the time on his phone every couple of seconds. Finally, the train arrived and Hinata stepped out, mask on her face. She didn't say a word. She slowly walked over to Riku and fell into his arms. He removed the mask around her face and gasped. Her mouth had been slit open ear to ear. Hinata collapsed onto the ground. Riku dropped to his knees next to her and cried into her neck. He heard footsteps coming from the train. A pair of black boots approached him. He looked up. The masked woman in a trench coat was standing above him. Can I ask you a question? Jean had just moved to Cebu City in the Philippines, leaving his boyfriend Kevin alone in their apartment in Manila. The gig is only a couple of months, Jean assured Kevin over video chat. You have to video call me every day after work, okay? You promise? Promise. A week had gone by and Jean kept his word. They talked every single night. He didn't love that Kevin was so needy, but he knew that he was going through a lot and was working on it with his therapist and knew that this relationship was worth holding on to. 
One night, Jean and Kevin were on a video call, as usual. Jean was on his computer in his room, his back turned to his bedroom door. He was telling Kevin about the long shoot he had that day, when Kevin's brow wrinkled. Babe, I thought you said you lived alone. Yeah, I do. Then, who just walked past your doorway? Jean swiveled his chair around. Oh, you're probably seeing the tree outside. One sec. Jean left the room for a minute and returned. Kevin's heart began to pound. There's this tree outside that casts weird shadows, but I closed the curtains so it won't bother you anymore, okay? Kevin's silent face stared back. Show me the tree. Are, are you serious? Show me the tree. Jean let out a heavy sigh and picked up his laptop. Kevin watched intently as Jean aimed the camera at the windows. He opened the curtain, revealing a barren, eerily shaped tree. He then pointed the camera towards the doorway, where a humanoid shadow appeared. Kevin hung his head in shame and chuckled. Kev, if this is going to work, we need to trust each other. I know, I know. Sorry. I'll be better, I swear. Kevin held his pinky up to the camera. Jean did the same. The next night, Jean and Kevin hopped on a video call. Jean was filling him in on how his shoot went when somebody crossed the doorway behind him. Jean was so focused on telling his story that he didn't even notice the shift in Kevin's expression. Kevin continued to nod and pretend to listen while he secretly began to record their video call, both hoping and not hoping to see the person walk by again. A half hour had gone by, and Kevin's focus had never left the doorway. Are you okay? You've been kind of quiet. Yeah, sorry, I'm just kind of tired, that's all. Okay, well, I miss you. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Just as Jean ended the call, Kevin caught something moving in the doorway. He quickly replayed the recording. In the last few moments before Jean ended the call, there was a single frame of what was clearly a man standing in his doorway. Kevin's heart sank. The next day, Kevin's anxiety was at an all-time high. Gene had been lying to him, and now he had proof. But how was he going to call him out on it? Kevin was giving himself a stomach ache thinking about it. He decided that when they got on their nightly call, he would just be direct. 7 p.m. came, and Kevin answered Jean's call. Hi, Kev. How was your day? But Kevin didn't say a word. He shared his screen, revealing the screenshot from the video from last night. Mm, I don't get it. What is that? You've been lying to me, Jean. Why would you do this to me? Kev, I swear. I don't know who that is. I swear. He held his pinky up to the camera. We're done, Jean. I'm going to start looking for my own place. Have fun with your friend. Oh, look, there he is. The man entered Jean's bedroom. Kevin ended the call and cried into his hands. After a few moments, he collected himself and pulled up the recording of the video call he just ended. Show me your face, you bastard. He scrubbed the video until the end. The man entered the bedroom. Jean turned around, fell out of his seat, and screamed. As the man got closer to camera, Kevin's eyes got wider. The man appeared to have a gaping hole in his chest. He then grabbed Jean's face and the call ended. Kevin sat in silence for a moment. Whatever he saw could not have been human. He began searching the man's description on the internet. A few articles came up. Walai Kasing Kasing, the man with no heart. According to multiple websites, Walai Kasing Kasing was once a man. He never found love in life and became old and bitter. When he passed, he became a ravenous spirit, just as bitter as he was in life, seeking out fragile relationships and breaking them down so that everyone can be miserable like he was. Once he's gained enough power from the negative energy they produce, he consumes the couple and moves on to the next. Kevin couldn't look away from his screen. This was all his fault. 
he quickly booked a ticket to Cebu City and headed straight for the airport. A few hours later, he found himself outside of Jean's apartment. Jean was not answering the buzzer or his phone. It was too early in the morning for any of the other tenants to walk out and let him in. Kevin looked around the building, trying to come up with a plan. And that's when he noticed the familiar, creepy tree. There was only one set of windows immediately next to it. Kevin raced over to the window and managed to push it open. He climbed inside the apartment. It was quiet. Kevin called out for Jean. No response. Across the apartment was a room with light emanating from the open doorway. Kevin carefully made his way toward it. As he got closer, he heard a very odd sound. It was familiar, but he couldn't place it. He crept up to the doorway and slowly looked inside the room. At the desk was Jean's limp, lifeless body. He was in the arms of a skinless, hellish creature who was devouring Jean's chest. Kevin let out a horrified gasp. The creature lifted its head with bits of Jean's heartstrings still dangling from its mouth and lunged at the doorway. When my grandpa was about 25 years old, the tree outside his home in the Philippines was always swarming with bats. And the bats are eating the so he went out with his gun to see if he could scare them away. He fired one shot, but the bats seemed unfazed. He fired another, still nothing. But then there was a cuss, cuss. That's when the bats flew away. My grandpa believes that the sound was coming from an aswang. And like the bats, he got the hell out of there. An aswang is one of the most feared creatures in the Philippines. This is my interpretation of one of the most popular legends surrounding them. Decades ago, a woman named Maria lived in Capiz, a province in the Bisayan region of the Philippines. She lived there with her husband, Jose, and their two children. Maria had just lost her job, and her husband couldn't support the family on his policeman's salary alone. So Maria made the decision to find work overseas and send money back home. It was a difficult decision to make, one that many Filipinos have made, but Jose assured her that it would be best for the family. We will talk every week, and he won't be gone forever, just until I get a higher paying job or until you can find work again. We can do this. And so Maria moved to Canada and found a job as a caregiver to an eccentric and very wealthy elderly man named Harry. Maria had been a caregiver to many people before, but this man was definitely interesting. He requested that after sundown, Maria lock his bedroom and not enter until the sun rises the next morning. He handed her a set of keys, one key for each of the six locks on the door. Maria thought his need for privacy was a bit excessive. But what if you need me in the middle of the night? I won't. Are you some sort of vampire? Come now, Maria. Vampires aren't real. After the old man had been locked away, Maria called her family. Because international phone calls were very expensive, Maria limited herself to one conversation with her family per week. She told Jose about the old man's strange request. It worries me. What if something happens to him while he's locked up and I can't get in? Maybe he's just a light sleeper and doesn't like being disturbed. What do you think the police will do if they see that he died in a room that I sealed? They will arrest me. I don't know if this is a good idea. You'll be fine. He's paying almost three times what others would. We need this, Maria. So Maria carried on. She assisted Harry in the bathroom. She prepared his meals and medication and even played card games with him. And although he was very old and frail, his mind was bright and alert. Harry told Maria stories about his three kids. One was a doctor, another a lawyer, and one a teacher. When he spoke of them, his face lit up, as only a proud father would. 
How often do you see them? Oh my, I don't even think I can recall the last time I saw them in person. They do not visit you? That's terrible, Maria exclaimed, a heaviness forming in her chest. But Harry seemed completely unbothered. They have their own lives. That night, when Maria called her husband, she told him about what Harry said, about not having seen his kids in years. I've only been away from you and the kids for a few months. I can't imagine what not seeing you for years would feel like. He acted like it was normal. I feel so sorry for him. You don't know what their relationship is like. I'm sure there is pain that he's not showing you. It was rather curious. Why hadn't his children visited him in so long? Perhaps they had a falling out of some kind? But what kind of fight would lead to abandoning your elderly father? Forever. Harry seemed like such a kind and gentle man. A little weird, sure, but he was agreeable. She wondered. What if it had something to do with him locking himself up at night? Maria's curiosity was piqued. She had to know. That night, Maria helped Harry into bed like every other night. But when she closed the door, she didn't fully close all the locks. She waited a few hours to make sure he was asleep, before carefully removing the locks one by one. She took a deep breath, she slowly turned the doorknob and gently pushed the door open, inch by inch. The light from the hallway seeped into the room, piercing the darkness. The light fell upon the bed. The empty bed. Harry was gone. Maria reflexively turned the bedroom light on. Harry wasn't in his bed. She began to panic. She felt around the covers, under the bed. That's when she heard a soft breath coming from behind her. She carefully turned around. Standing in front of her was a six foot, slimy skinned humanoid creature. It towered over her, its hot breath falling onto her face. The creature lifted an arm and motioned with its long bony finger for Maria to come closer. Unsure if following its orders was better than not following it, Maria settled on the former. Step by step, she moved closer to the being. It unhinged its jaw and opened wide. Back in Capis, Jose was on his way home from a long shift. When he opened the door, he was confused as to why the door was already unlocked. A delicious aroma hit his nose from the kitchen. He followed the smell to find Maria cooking dinner. He was so happy to see her, he rushed over to embrace her. He was surprised by how much bonier she felt in his arms. She excitedly told him that dinner was almost ready and motioned for him to take a seat at the table. Jose took a seat and stared at the woman at the stove. Is everything okay, dear? I'm just tired and hungry from my trip. She pulled a large tray out of the oven and hastily placed it on the table. Let's eat! Maria sat down and began shoveling food onto her plate. Jose called out for the kids to come join them, but there was no response. He turned to Maria and asked her where the kids were. Her mouth was so full of meat that it muffled her response. Um, what, what did you say, dear? Maria swallowed and raised the bone she was holding and gestured to the tray. They're right here. Jose froze. Maria said nothing. Jose pulled out his bolo knife and slashed Maria's face, leaving a long gash from her brow to her cheek. She shrieked in pain, get out of here and never come back, you monster. Maria ran out the door. It is said that Maria still roams the town of Capis at night. So beware of any women with a slash across your face. You might become her next meal. In Filipino folklore, there are many ways one can become an aswang. In this particular story, Harry was an aswang and transferred his curse to Maria by opening his mouth and letting the black chick inside him hop out of his stomach and into hers. In passing his power along, Harry also lost his immortality and passed away shortly after. 
The story of Maria Labo resonates with Filipinos because it's a fear many have. It's common for Filipinos to move to another country to provide for their family. This means not being able to see their family for months or years. In some cases, they never see them again. Being away for so long is stressful. You don't know if they're going to return or if they do, if they'll return as the same person you once knew. What would you do if someone you loved suddenly became a monster? If you don't want nightmares tonight, like and share this story and subscribe to my channel. Submit your own stories to storieswithsapphire at gmail.com. For more spooky, supernatural, and spiritual stories, listen to the Stories with Sapphire podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. If you like what you saw and would like to support this independently run show, head over to patreon.com slash storieswithsapphire. Until we meet again, sleep tight.